So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is James Walsh. Uh, I'm Head of Membership Engagement here at the PLSA. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this Policy Insights webinar on Pensions Dashboards, 12 Months to Connect. Um, and the whole point of these webinars is about informing our members what's going on in the policy world, and particularly this morning, helping you to understand what's happening with pensions dashboards, and in particular, what you as people running schemes have got to do and when. Um, before anyone asks, we'll be circulating material afterwards. That'll be a recording, uh, the handful of slides, just a few slides, and also a link to our website where you'll find a very handy two-page checklist that my colleague Richard Smith uh, has put together, and that very clearly shows schemes uh, a nice summary of what they need to do uh, and when. So Richard is our pensions expert here at the PLSA. He's going to be one of our speakers uh, this morning. We're also joined by Lorraine Harper from Mercer, who is chair of the accreditation committee at PASA. We're joined by Anna Rogers, who is senior partner at uh, Art Law. And Anna's going to be talking a little bit about liabilities and legal issues schemes need to watch out for. And we've also got Dave Tong, who is chief technology officer at Morning Dave. Uh, Dave's at Money Hub. Uh, and uh, they've been putting together one of the first dashboards and he's gonna give us a real live demo of an actual dashboard, which uh, I believe is a world first, uh, seeing a real dashboard, not a mock-up. And you see it here at the PLSA. So it's gonna be great. So um, we're gonna try and make this quite conversational. And my first sort of question I'm gonna to put to, to Richard. Uh, morning, Richard. And um, Richard, when we talk about pensions dashboards, what does that actually mean in practice? Uh, thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for attending. I think most folk know now that pensions dashboards are a suite of technologies working together. Um, very simply, three layers. There's going to be the front end dashboards that users see, and they're being developed by potential providers like Money Hub and, and, and Dave that we're going to see today. Then in the middle, the second layer is the government's digital finder service, and that's what's being procured and built by the Pensions Dashboard program being run by Chris Curry. And then at the bottom or the back end, there's all the data connections that by law, every pension scheme is going to have to uh, have made on their behalf. For example, by their third party administrator like Mercer, which is why we've asked uh, Lorraine to come along uh, today. Two core processes that run through that. An individual logs into a dashboard and consents for their personal data to be passed to all pension schemes. And then the schemes have to compare their records to see if they can make a match to find a pension. And if they make a positive match, uh, the scheme has to pass a prescribed set of data back to whichever dashboard the individual is using so they can view their, their pensions information. Now, because there are so many layers and so many different moving parts, a key message we've been hearing from PLSA member schemes is a real concern about who's liable if things should go wrong at any stage of the process. And that's a key reason why we uh, wanted to invite Anna here as a, as a pensions expert lawyer to, to tell us something about that. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And it'd be good to turn to Anna straight, straight away, uh, uh, Anna. I mean, maybe you can give us a bit of context, Anna, because um, Richard's right. This is an issue I know our members uh, do raise quite frequently. What is their potential liability? if things go wrong. What can you say about that? I've got a slide on this about the legal context. I mean, it's all very complicated, as Richard says, but schemes basically have to do three things, connect to the ecosystem, match with a member and provide data. Um, it's complicated, things may go wrong, schemes will face dashboard fines potentially, plus um, and maybe uh, data protection fines for for breach, maybe on matching and potentially on providing data, user claim for loss. The PDP was going to produce a document called the liability, um, what's it called, the liability model, which I don't think we have seen yet. But really, um, I think the bottom line is that these things are all fairly sensible and liabilities will sit where they ought to sit according to who's responsible. The recoverable loss is something that I was worried about a while ago. I think a lot of lawyers were, and I'm not so worried now. The principles are fairly clear. 
for, for a, if, if a user is given the wrong information, they have to take, informa uh, take action or not take action, relying on the information that's provided. They have to suffer a financial loss, not just loss of expectation because figures turn out less than they were told. If they saved more than they needed to, that isn't a loss because they've still got the savings. And the scheme needs to be in breach of duty and the loss needs to be caused by that breach. So the user has to show what they did in reliance on the information they were given what, and what they would have done if they'd had different information. And these principles are fairly well established and I think they would be quite difficult for users to, um, to make a successful claim for recoverable loss. The liability certainly starts with the trustees, but they can point to administrators. Um, I think we'll talk about that a bit more. The problem obviously being that Scheme Admin wasn't really built for this. Um, and what people like me who help schemes prepare for buyout know is that trustees only really tend to do a deep dive into checking their benefit structure at that stage. And it costs a lot of money. And I was worried a year ago, what does that process system not need to do to be ready for dashboards? And actually, I think the answer is a lot more reassuring than I was expecting then. So we'll develop those themes, I think, as we go along, James. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And uh, great to hear you uh, striking that uh, slightly re re reassuring uh, note. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, just a reminder uh, to all our delegates, and I can see we've got 150 or so already, um, you can type your questions in at any uh, point. Uh, you know, we're, we're happy to take questions as we go um, along. Uh, I can see, in fact, there's an old question already come in from uh, one Steve uh, Webb. Uh, good morning to you, Steve. Uh, and so let's take Steve's question uh, straight away before coming back to, to Richard, who's got our next sort of section. Uh, Steve asks, uh, is there a temptation for schemes to err on the side of not supplying data? Legal risks presumably are much greater if the data supplied and wrong in some way than if simply a no match or a partial match is returned. Anna, I think maybe uh, that's one for you. Yeah, I think schemes probably will err on the side of not making a match or saying maybe um, to a match. And, and we will have to, to think that through. I mean, what, you know, why are they unable to do that? Is it their fault because they haven't done enough homework um, or, or is it a sort of forgivable? breach. In terms of the provision, the data that's provided, I think let's address that later in the webinar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll certainly do that. Okay, uh, Richard, just coming back to you, how many dashboards do you think there are we're going to be? Well, I, I don't think, I don't think of them as dashboards. I think of this whole uh, initiative as more additional functionality within existing tools, existing apps. I mean, so for example, um, I bank with Lloyds Bank and on my phone, I do a lot of my banking on the Lloyds uh, online banking app. I'm sure many of you watching today do something similar with whoever you, you bank with. So I don't know if they're going to, but I think it's quite probable that um, Lloyds will add a new button in the app when I'm logged into it, saying something like search for all my pensions. So that will be the Lloyds Bank pensions dashboard, if you like. Um, and I can see a lot of banks and pension providers um, wanting to include that button. Why wouldn't you want to help your customers have a more holistic view of their overall retirement provision? And I think this really is why it's not so helpful to talk about the pensions dashboard. I think saying I'm going to use the pensions dashboard is a bit like saying I'm going to watch the news. Well, which news? BBC News, ITN, Sky News, Al Jazeera. I think in a way to continue the analogy, the news stories are the same, but there are many ways of accessing them. Oh, I think you're on mute. I was. I think no, that puts it really, really well, Richard. So as well as the banks, I mean, who else do you think might be, might we see providing dashboards? Well, I think maybe networks of independent, independent financial advisors, for example, or maybe um, retirement or, and drawdown product providers, that sort of thing. I think lots of organisations could be interested and there'll also be one provided by the government and that'll be the money helper dashboard yeah. um, from the, the money and pension service. But I think the really interesting question is which will people use? Um, and some new research that was published just in January said that um, 
people said, I and mean, what they say they'll do isn't always what they will do, but what they said they will do is probably use this facility in a place where they already have a relationship, a place where they're comfortable and a place where they already have trust. For example, their banking app. But what we thought would be really interesting is what PLSA member schemes think. So I think, James, we've got a, a poll question on this. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I think we're just gonna bring the poll question up on screen so we can probe a bit more into this question of where people might might choose to look for their, their dashboard information or their pension information. So you should be able to see the poll question now. Uh, I'm gonna read it out and you can tick as many of the answers uh, as you like. So the question is for your schemes members who are interested in using pensions dashboard services, where do you think they'll look for and use them? Where would you look? Uh, and the uh, potential answers are their online banking app, one of their pension schemes or providers' websites, a financial advisor's app, the money helper service from MAPS or other. And you could type your answer in the chat box, but other. So that's online banking app, uh, pension scheme or provider's website, financial advisor's app, or the money helper service from MAP or something else or other. Okay, so um, I think that's it closed. So 85% uh, uh, of, of you say uh, you expect people to look at one of their pension scheme or providers websites. So that's clearly the one where you think people are going to be looking at most, but also about half of you think that people might look at Money Helper uh, or online banking apps, rather less for financial advisors, just 20% uh, for those. So that's, that's quite an interesting um, set of results. So Richard, is that uh, what you might've expected? Uh Yes, I think so. Um, I think that probably reflects the research that I mentioned in the published in January that where individuals already have a relationship. Um, but I suppose an interesting follow on from that is what level of um, uh, uh, digital account sign up to pension schemes and providers already have. I think the national average from research I've seen is about 10%. So I don't know, I'd be interested to hear if anyone wants to put in the chat, you know, what proportion of their deferred and active membership have actually signed up to have uh, a digital uh, account um, on their pension providers or pension website or already. So I think the interesting thing will be, how will those relationships be developed in the next 12, 18, 24 months? Because where those relationships exist is probably where then people will then look to press that search for all my pensions button once they become available. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to remind you, if you've got questions, do uh, do put them in the Q and A box rather than chat. But I am trying to keep an eye on both. I think Anna's got a comment, though. Anna. Yeah, I've got a question for Richard. Just looking at the comments coming in in the chat, I think some people are saying it would be confusing to have these different dashboards because you have to go and look in different places, and that isn't how it's supposed to work, is it? I think a key element, and this will come out um, in in what what Dave's going to show, I think, but also. Um, in more consultation over this summer is the design standards for all dashboards, which means they're all going to have the same content and display it in the same way, if that makes sense. So in a way, government has given with one hand and taken back with the other. Do you see what I mean? So it said, yes, we want a lot of people to, to see their pension. So we want to make them available in lots of different places, but we're gonna constrain what can be shown and how it can be shown. And the other point to make is there's one middle bit so every dashboard is doing the same secure government digital search, if that makes sense. So even though the data is being displayed, if you like, I suppose it's like all news stories have got to come from Reuters and you can only say it in the way that Reuters say, you've got to say, I don't know, something like that, if you see what I mean. So, so the, 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 the bit that does the find is one central government digital service. And Richard, can I just pick up a... Comment that's coming from Christine Scott in the in no, I beg you not no, I beg you from Helen Helen Wilcox uh, in the chat who says if there are so many different dashboards, will trustees have to choose which dashboard they will use? Is that how you see it, or is that sort of missing one of the points somehow? What's your James? Comment? You highlighted a little bit earlier, I think the checklist, the scheme checklist which we did. Um, I think point ten at the bottom of the ten actions on there is consider what you want to say to your members. So, you know, there's, I think there's a, a journey for all trustee bodies and pension managers to think about is, well, where do we think our deferred members and active members 
should actually be going to look at their pensions. Is, is it our website? Do we want to be showing them not just our schemes pension, but all, all, all the others as well? Or do we want to be uh, perhaps thinking, maybe if we've got a DC scheme and we've got a preferred advisor that we send people to already, maybe are they going to be offering a dashboard? So I think there's a, a consideration for all schemes in terms of where they want to be uh, pointing people. The information okay. will be the same for everyone on any dashboard, whatever the scheme chooses to spot, spot encourage. On. Yeah. Spot on. It's, it's all about getting as many people to see their pensions as possible. And you'll probably have heard Chris Curry saying that people probably won't go looking for dashboards. They will stumble across them in somewhere where they already have a relationship. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. OK, well, let's have a think about what all this is actually going to look like for the saver. And uh, Dave, Dave Tong from... Money Hub, I know, has been has been working uh, in this area, Dave, developing uh, a, a pension dashboard. Dave, can you tell us a little bit? And I think you're going to sort of give us a little demo. Can you tell us a bit about how the build has been going on? You, you work with a uh, with PDP, how that's been going for you um, and how you've been getting on with building a dashboard? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll start showing a demo in, in, in just a minute. But yeah, we we are so many have we're one of the alpha participants, um, you know, in, in the kind of this rollout of the pension dashboard ecosystem. Um, and so at the moment, you know, we've got strong engagement with with the program and there's lots of usability testing going on and developing of standards. And so, uh, you know, in, in, in over the next couple of months. Uh, the different alpha um, providers and dashboards will be hooking up to kind of this alpha uh, sort of sandbox. Um, and then, you know, throughout through, through through later in the year, we'll move into a beta phase where actually there will be some actual real data with with real users. And so, yeah, at the moment, it's, it's going well. And we, we've got a demo just to kind of, I suppose, illustrate some of what will be possible to show. Absolutely. Yeah, it'd be great to see that, Dave. Yeah, fire away. Okay, um, and just it's just worth uh, flagging up, I suppose, um, you know, the, the regulations here are, are still in, in flux in consultation in, in the sense that, you know, we um, are planning to apply to be a, a qualified um, pension dashboard service, um, but the FCA haven't yet launched their sort of consultation on that, let, let alone kind of updated the legislation. So, you know, we, we are a potential dashboard provider. And what I'm going to show you is based on the current emerging technical standards and kind of the design standards, which again, still in development. So, so with those caveats that it's, it's not the, the, the finished product, but we felt it's quite useful just to get something out there to illustrate, this is what dashboards could look like. So, um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll give a bit of commentary along the way, but you know, as, as kind of, um, you know, Richard has explained, uh, there is this central um, search service and so, you know, we, we are at a dashboard. This is, for example, a, a sample dashboard. I'm assuming I'm already logged in um, to this. And, you know, as, as was mentioned, it's likely that people may be on some existing website and be given the choice, oh, do you want to search and view all of your, your pensions? And so to do that, I, I need to send the user to a central uh, consent and authorization service. So this is a central service. This is, um, and we've got a sort of a, a sample version of it here, but when this goes live, uh, this will be using the government central service uh, and all dashboards will use the same service. Um, and the first stage then is to verify my identity. Now, for the purpose of sort of this demo, uh, we're just using um, a Google kind of as an identity provider. Um, in the production system, there'll be firms like Digi Identity and other firms who will provide a really strong level of assurance of an individual user's identity. Um, also in the live system, uh, as an end user, I will need to self-assert my national insurance number and previous addresses. Um, so that will all happen in this central place. Um, so once my identity has been verified, I will need to consent. And so this consent is to do a couple of things. Um, I need to grant permission for this search to be done for all of my pensions, and then grant permission also to share that pension data with a dashboard. And again, because in this ecosystem, there can be multiple dashboards. Here, I'm sharing it with a, a nicely named sample dashboard. Um, so when the user agrees, uh, behind the scenes, and uh, we, we will share, share this sort of sandbox later, uh, there's all sorts of API calls and find requests going out to you know, all of the different pension providers um, who, who are registered. Um, but, but that's also lot, lots of magic happening behind the scenes, but the user's gonna end up back on a dashboard. And so, you know, this is our, you know, our initial prototype where we've actually found eight pensions for this particular user. Now, uh, we haven't currently modeled sort of a maybe match at the moment. Um, and, and that is something that we, we will show. 
Uh, but at the moment, we're exploring just, you know, making sure we're informing the user that these these figures are indicative estimates, and you know that they, 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 you know, before making any um, kind of you know decisions, they do need to kind of speak to uh, the particular scheme or provider. So um, this dashboard again, and we're, we're working on a few different prototypes. But currently, um, you know, assuming we're allowed to do some totaling in the design standards, which is still under discussion, uh, we, we'd quite like to show the user just this this main figure, what their estimated monthly amount. Uh, of income will, will be. Uh, we're exploring, you know, the whole issues with, with gross and net and giving you the option for, for annual and, and monthly, etc. Um, and we're here as well, we, we think it'd be quite useful to, you know, to reference retirement living standards. And um, so for this particular user, uh, that they have a standard between moderate and comfortable. So if we now look at the underlying data, where, where this is, is come from, uh, we can see, and this is actually, you know, based on, on realistic data. So we, we have different amounts coming in at different times uh, because that, that is a reality. Not everyone's gonna receive um, a pension income from the different um, products that they have all at the same time. Um, so we've got this coming in. This is actually a mixture of um, BC, DB schemes and the state pension. Um, and so this is all, um, you know, uh, you know, displaying it though, just with this one monthly figure. So uh, if I just kind of show you a few little parts of this, so I could go and have a look at the underlying data behind this. Um, so this is a, a DB pension and we are, you know, trying to inform the user about some of the limitations of these figures. And, and for example, this is one thing we wanted to call out, you know, um, that, that dashboards and people using dashboards might result in sort of more uh, contact to administrators uh, for users to, to get kind of up-to-date quotations and, and the options available. Um, so yeah, this is just some, some of the underlying data uh, that we, in the data standards, we, we will be able to get back. Um, we also have, for example, uh, a DC scheme. And, and for here, we can see things like the uh, actual pension pot um, size, which in our um, current prototype, this is sort of a little bit hidden away because we're trying to get users to kind of focus on just what the potential monthly income uh, could be. Uh, and then just nearly finish this. Uh, we're also exploring showing a graphical representation. So again, assuming this is sort of allowed on the design standards, just to try and illustrate to the user that yes, this sort of, it's not just one fixed kind of total income coming at one time, but actually um, it, it might change. Now there are all sorts of complexities with this because some of these um, pensions uh, will be increasing. Uh, you know, and, and there's all sorts of other things about, you know, spouses and dependents. So it's not possible to show everything. But yeah, hopefully this gives you a, a little view of kind of what a dashboard um, could look like. And, you know, for us, we, we are really excited to be, you know, involved with the, the PDP, um, you know, as an alpha participant and just uh, working with industry to, you know, to develop this. And, um, you know, from our point of view, we're a software technology provider. You know, we, we really do see some really good benefits for end users for having lots of dashboards. I know in the comments, there were some questions, is it not going to be confusing for users? But actually the data available in each dashboard will be the same. And so I really think it's, it's, it's great to be able to actually get users when they're in that trusted relationship to, to get them to engage with their pensions. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's our little little demo, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Uh, well, Dave, the questions are absolutely flowing, flooding in. You 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 really sort of sort of kicked 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 it off, really. Um, let's see, we'll just take a couple of them. Uh, one of our anonymous attendees is asking: Is the scope to change how this is presented, e.g., figures along a timeline? You kind of shown that, I think, plainer English. Uh, I, I guess the answer to that is just just yes, isn't it? These are all going to look a bit different, aren't they? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of one of the consultations just closed and we, we are very much pushing, you know, DWP that the design standard should be mainly principle based. So there will be some variation between the different dashboards, but, um, but some things will sort of be kind of set in stone, obviously, because we don't want users to see kind of get a completely different picture on two different dashboards. Uh, but yeah, so that is a little bit sort of in the air about exactly how much latitude we all have as a dashboard provider. Yeah. And Alex Kitching uh, from, from Vodafone, uh, she's asking how much of a challenge will it be to provide real-time information for DB schemes? What about DB? I, I, might, I might defer that one to Richard, actually. Okay, yeah, fine. Let's bring Richard in. Uh, absolutely. Dave, I don't know if you, whether you can share it again and, and maybe show the, the first prudential uh, pension. So 
uh, you may have seen in the consultation on the DWP regs that's just closed, um, the requirement is that you show uh, a, a DB pension at a date in the last 12 months. So that's why that third paragraph there says, this is the latest estimate available to be shown on pensions dashboard. So for example, for an active member, it might be the figure that was shown on the benefit statement. For deferred members, more of a problem. Now, many large schemes already annually revalue all of their deferreds. For example, when I was pension manager at National Grid, we had 20,000 deferreds and annually we revalue them all. So that would be the figure. Um, for smaller schemes who don't do that, there's a there's a job to be done by their administrators to get a figure which is which is brought up to date each year. But a really key thing to flag here is this isn't real time. This is going to be an indicative snapshot as at dates in the last 12 months. So this is why, really why the design, design standards need to make very, very clear that these aren't up to the minute figures. That, that are being calculated now. It's a, it's, it's a snapshot at various dates over the last 12 months, because of course the dates will all be different across your different schemes, because they'll all have different benefit statement dates. Uh, so it's a rough and ready snapshot. And if you want to engage more, and the international evidence shows that not most people, not many people do, maybe about 10, 20, 30% of people do something after viewing a dashboard. But if you want to do something, it's probably talk to your scheme. OK, thanks, Richard. And Dave, I can see you've got to you've got one founder, Andy Dunlop, says he likes the graphical representation you showed nice and clear and he appreciates the complexities. So uh, that's good. Let's have another couple of questions because there's absolutely loads. Uh, Andrew Richardson um, uh, asks uh, if a dashboard shows um, a forecast pension from multiple pensions and possibly combined DB and DC arrangements, then various assumptions will have to be made, e.g. on investment returns and DC. Will there be standardised assumptions to be used by all dashboards providers? Otherwise, different dashboards could give different expected um, amounts. I I'm wondering, actually, if that's one where I should bring in Lorraine, actually. Do you have a, have a comment on that, Lorraine, from your uh, administrator side of things? Well, from an administrative perspective, we we're a bit concerned about this, as you might imagine, because members could easily get confused. Um, and not be able to compare like with like. Um, and, uh, and so that's a concern. And as part of the consultation, we have gone back to the DWP and, and made some comments about this. But um, uh, the choices, I understand it, are to apply the scheme rules in the, in the values that we provide back to, to dashboard or, or this other simplified approach. And I think the simplified approach from our perspective feels as though there's more opportunity for confusion by members there's the potential for members not to trust us when they they get a value from dashboard and then they get a formal quote from us and it's different you know the figures are, are not the same there's concern there and uh, and so this is very much a point for debate in the industry but I think generally speaking um the the industry is very much concerned about this and has fed that back in the consultation James, can I just jump in quickly on Please DC, do. broadening from what Lorraine's saying? So on defined contribution income projected into the future. Dave, I, don't, I think you're still sharing. I don't know whether you can go to the list. Um, there is currently another consultation. Obviously, DC projections are controlled by what's it called? The Actuarial Standard Technical Memorandum 1, ASTM 1 from the Financial Reporting Council, FRC. They are proposing to change that basis, to standardise that basis. So, yes, there will be standardised growth assumptions and standardised uh, assumptions for converting the projected pot into an, an, uh, an income. So, for example, if you scroll down, Dave, the uh, uh, Aviva Nest and Scottish Widows, they would all be produced on the new basis from October 23 onwards uh, on the standardised DC basis. Um, but absolutely, in terms of DB and DC, one thing that we're saying in our responses to the consultations is that obviously DB incomes typically do increase in payment and they do have spouses or dependents pensions payable on death. Whereas um, if you quote a single life, non-increasing DC annuity, that's a different beast. So absolutely, we need to find ways to indicate that to the individual. But coming back to the point of this is an indicative snapshot. This really isn't what you're going to get. It's an indicative snapshot. Maybe those um, issues diminish. This will all need to be thoroughly user tested uh, as we as we move through the spring, summer and autumn of this year. Yeah. OK, thanks. Well, Dave, uh, thanks for your, your demo. It's fascinating to see what this might well 
uh, look like in practice. That's great. I want to come back to Anna now. And I think, Anna, you're going to talk a little bit more about this key issue of what are the risks for schemes. Yeah, could I have a, I've got another slide here with a list on it. <clears throat> so, you know, start from the beginning. The key thing for schemes is to engage with administrators now. The first thing is know your proposed staging date. So for schemes with less than a thousand actives and deferreds, because that's that's the way that the staging date is measured. It's going to be not before late 2024, probably 2025, and maybe the time timing will flip. So for other than the biggest schemes, there is quite a lot of time. Um, and, and to work out that staging date, it, I said it's the number of actives and deferreds that matter. Um, and there are some techie points there about knowing who to count and also if the scheme provides DC and DB benefits hybrid scheme and knowing whether uh, there can be different staging dates or it's the earlier of the two depending on how many DB or DC members are. so a bit of due diligence to do on your own scheme so you know how much time you've got you need to talk to the administrators about their confidence level about being able to connect and being able to match because all these member requests that are made in the country are going to go to all schemes in the country and that's likely to be millions you know, in, in, in every day um, and then if if you've made a match with somebody what do you actually have to provide under the regulations for deferred pensioners and this doesn't apply when pensions are in payment but deferred you just have to provide a single figure is the deferred pension at leaving revalued to date? That seems to be the intention. I think there's a glitch in the regulations there, but, but some measure of revaluation to date is being consulted on and considered. So do data and systems allow for this? Um, are there any underpins? What does the scheme do at the moment? There are wide differences between different schemes. I would suggest it's also a very sensible precaution for a scheme to have a look at their deferred benefit structure because some schemes have scheme specific revaluation that doesn't fit that comfortably with statutory. It's quite hard to measure midway through deferment and a decision is going to need to be made about what needs to be built into systems so that these figures can be mass produced right across the whole membership within a recent time scale if it's not completely uh, in real time. And there can be other errors in benefit structure that now is the time to check them. If you've got active members, you also have to provide a projection. So if you're open to future accrual, you have to assume that the member carries on in service, but excluding future salary rises, but just to include the accrual and to project DC income. And there's a catch there in that some types of special deferreds count as actives if they've got a salary link plus other benefits on top that bring them in that definition. That, that may be tweaked. So again, you've got to know whether you've got actives that will require the scheme to provide projections. And where there are projections, there's a requirement in the regulations to give explicit flags if the information provided is partial to help the user to understand it better. And that's mandatory and not well defined and schemes that do have to provide projections would be well advised to start thinking if the regulations are made in something like that form what will they provide so it was useful to see dave's illustration because there was information uh sorry the dashboard there was information there that is more than what i've said here so mention of early retirement and and so on um and commutation at retirement there's also a requirement to say whether the pension carries increases and whether it carries the survivor's pension, which is pretty alarming level of simplification from a legal point of view. It seems to be a yes, no requirement that uh, does not allow for any of the nuances of benefit structures. So at a basic level, this obviously means extra costs, extra admin costs, certainly for the transition and perhaps on an ongoing basis. Um, especially if schemes are going to encourage people to get in touch for more personalized information. So those costs need to be budgeted and maybe conversations need to start with employers about possible contributions going up. Can we go on to the next slide? But the reason Richard says this project is all about hope and fear. And the reason that I have more hope than you might be expecting from the lawyer on the panel is that I think the dashboard information is going to be inherently reliable. So I, I am recommending that schemes find out how much time they've got and use that time wisely to try and make their deferred data as 
and benefit as accurate as they can. But the fact is that radical simplification is necessary for the dashboards to work. And what these regulations are going to do is make us make everything look like an apple for the purpose of comparison. And if it turns out to be a pear or an orange or something, which we all know that it is, well, that's, that's not our fault. The, the choice has to be made and has been made for simplification as opposed to accuracy. The crude values for deferreds are not a real estimate. They're a snapshot of revaluation mid deferment. I think in fact they perhaps are meant to include GMP revaluation, but no revaluation legally uh, kicks in mid deferment or would be very rare under scheme rules. And DC pots have to be projected forwards on assumptions about investment returns and converted into income on assumptions about what people will do and what kind of annuity they provide, that's not going to reflect real, real world choices and events. Um, so data for deferred might be incorrect, but it seems to me that's a second order issue compared to these more fundamental um, areas of unreliability. And crucial information will be omitted. So the right to reduce, unreduced early retirement will be invisible. And so we'll split NRA 60 and 65 tranches. The terms for second life pensions, for example, if there's an unmarried uh, dependent qualified, do post leaving or post retirement marriages qualify? What about deathbed marriages within six months before death? There's lots of small print in pension schemes. Uh, and members who see a statement saying this does provide a spouse pension or survivor pension are inevitably in some cases going to be misled and disappointed by that. Um, pension increase rights, they may be split between nil tranches and increasing tranches, and there may be multiple increasing tranches. I mean, pensions are complicated. PB pensions are complicated, and DC pensions have different um, issues. So I think the bottom line is that the order, the order of magnitude is the goal here behind the regulations and the whole project. And that means that it is fair and right for schemes to be protected against people complaining if things turn out in the real world different from what was indicated. And that's why it is crucial to have mandatory standard disclaimer wording. Uh, notice there was some wording on Dave's dashboard that he showed. No doubt there'll be a lot of discussion about what that wording should be. Members may not understand it, but from a legal point of view, disclaimer wording is effective. Um, and the pensions ombudsman, who we haven't mentioned, yes, and the regulator, I think, would take members as having read and understood the disclaimer. It's clearly, we'll see from the user testing. But the user testing so far shows that people struggle to see the difference between an annual pension figure and a pension pot. So I don't know how subtle the level of understanding is that we could ex expect from members. And the, the best thing that schemes can do is decide how far they're going to go to try to help members to understand, but also to make sure that their backs are covered in terms of not taking responsibility for being forced into a situation where they're pretending everything is an apple and it's not. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Really, really helpful. Lots to think about there. We've got um, a, one question that's come in uh, from Kevin Valentine. It's either for you or may, maybe for Lorraine. Um, uh, and he says, if somebody fraudulently manages to access somebody's dashboard, how do the trustees ensure that anybody subsequently contacting them hasn't obtained the member's pension information in this way? Have you got a comment on that, Anna? Oh, just on mute now again. Sorry, you could break that down into a number of different parts, but the dashboard isn't going to store the information. So, I mean, if somebody can fraudulently get themselves to a point where they've got a unique identifier as a different member, then I suppose they might be able to get their information. But, I, you know, cybersecurity and all the rest of it is a massive issue, but the information isn't going to live in the dashboard ecosystem. I think that might be the key Point Lorraine, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the data will, will exist in the administrator's uh, records and yeah. systems. So um, all administrators, I think, who've, who've actively started working on this have been through the pain of looking at how do we make sure that we're, we're 
responding to the right person. And, and there are different ways of achieving that. And, uh, and uh, we have landed on a, our own identity check that we will be conducting when we get requests from the dashboard. So we won't just be relying on the finder service, we'll, we'll be doing our own IDB checks as well. Thanks, Lorraine. And I think you've got quite a few more points you're going to make, uh, Lorraine, talking us through some of the issues from a third party administrator. Point Indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of administration, there are sort of four main areas that contain lots of issues. The first is the infrastructure. You have to have the infrastructure in place to be able to connect with the dashboard and provide the uh, required data. The second is data integrity. You know, what are we got in our database is it right are we going to be able to match um, members easily and then thirdly it's the whole area of automation and i think there have been one or two questions about this that i've seen already in order to provide a value back to the dashboard in a matter of seconds you have to have automated the ability to do that you can't have an administrator in the background doing a invoking a calculation it's, it's simply not possible so the levels of automation need to be properly assessed and then finally, there's the potential increase in demand for administration services. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tackle these very quickly. In terms of infrastructure, we had some big decisions to make. We have multiple schemes we look after. Um, and in, in next year, we've got about a thousand schemes we might have to put on the dashboard. So clearly, um, one of the things that was very apparent was allowing um, hits on our scheme databases was just not going to work for us for all sorts of reasons, including security. So we had a different way of doing with this and building a, an interface tool that, were, that would capture the necessary data. And so the dashboard would only communicate with that uh, single entity rather than each scheme database. That was the first thing we had to do. And so having designed the whole infrastructure, we then set about building it. Um, and we've been building it since the summer of last year. So it's quite a big project, so that's something to bear in mind. In terms of data integrity, uh, we've been looking at all our different pension schemes um, and, uh, and we've been looking at the amount of, of work we'll have to do to fill that electronic database with accurate data that might already be missing or might be suspect for example, temporary NI numbers, that kind of thing, um, so that we can communicate with each client individually to say, this is your starting point for dashboard readiness, um, and this is what you've got to do to be able to connect reliably with a user on the dashboard who's got a benefit in your scheme database. So that's, that's been quite a, a piece of work, and that is very scheme-specific. Um, and so is automation, because every scheme is in a different place with regard to automation. The smaller schemes tend to have very, very low levels of automation. The larger schemes have fairly high levels. But again, until we have you know, final regulations on, on what um, estimated retirement income is going to be, we can't finalise all our plans to do that. But it can take many, many months to automate benefits. So even though you might not be going into dashboard until 2024 you've got to be working on this throughout next year so you know and we're already through quarter one of this year um and then the potential increase on demand I, we we have no idea what what it's going to do but the fact is that people going onto dashboard seeing a figure will ignite interest so we would expect as normal an increase in demand for administration services so that means that we really do need those automated figures because the more information we can give people via the dashboard, the lower we hope the number of inquiries coming through. If we can't provide a value by, by the dashboard um, because we haven't got the level of automation in place, that's a calculation that's going to come into an administration team. Um, and, and we've got, if it's a DC scheme, we've got three days, I think, to provide the quote. If it's DB, 10 days, which is half the current disclosure rate regulations so there's a lot of uh, additional work and and you know if you think about it um the single biggest cost in pensions administration is human resources so you either throw lots more people at it or you try and digitize as much as you possibly can which brings you back to the whole idea of automating as much as possible so the increase in demand um is going to generate higher costs of ongoing administration there will be a new steady state 
We don't know what that's going to be. And we won't be able to assess it, I don't think, until at least the end of the first year the scheme is live on dashboard because of, we do expect a spike, which might be unusual. So, um, so it's, there's a lot of unknowns here, but there will be costs of implementation. There will be costs associated with additional workloads as well, and potentially ongoing administration. So what we want our clients to do right away is engage with us. Um, we want to talk to them. We want to share our plans with them about what we're going to do, partly to give them comfort that it's, it's all happening behind the scenes because ultimately trustee clients are responsible for this. They're responsible for compliance. We do the work in the background. Um, so they need to know that the administrator is, is on the case right now. And they also need to find out the amount of work that they have to do to reach compliance because that will need to be planned, it will need to be costed, and um, they will need to budget for it as well. So I think there's a lot of questions that trustees need to be asking of their administrators now and definitely engaging and planning with them at the moment. Thanks, Lorraine. And uh, Emma Mayall, I see, has fired in a question. She says, Lorraine, so how will you automate your additional identity checks so they don't delay for returning in seconds? And what are those additional checks? Well, I mean, this is partly our own intellectual capital here, but we, yeah, we are engaging with an external supplier and we are expecting that this, this new partnership will also bring many, many additional benefits to our business and our clients and our members. Um, so for example, we are planning to use um, an organization that will help us keep up to date the date, the date levels of data integrity. So we'll be doing more frequent tracing, more frequent mortality tracing, address tracing, that kind of thing. Um, and, and that will benefit the whole business. So not just dashboard. One of the things we've been doing um, uh, in connection with getting ready for dashboard is looking how these new requirements actually can be used to benefit the wider the business, the wider administration services that we've got. Because it is a significant investment for us so we want to get the most out of it we can. And I think all schemes should be looking at, at that sort of thing. You know, how can we use this opportunity um, to improve our administration for everyone? Yeah, absolutely right. And, and as you say, there is there's huge opportunities here. You know, it is as much about hope and positivity and better engagement for people with their pensions as about the sort of fear aspect and the uh, concerns and, and legalities. Is there more you wanted to say, Lorraine, about... Uh, exactly what schemes should be doing now and during the rest of 2022? I think the first thing to do is look at the data in some detail. A lot, I think a lot of um, our clients are, are relying on the old ways of producing you know, um, data validation certificates for the TPR returns. That's not the same as dashboard data. You know, it's, it's just not the same. So you do need to have a good look at the data sitting in the electronic database now what needs to be there in order to comply with the dashboard requirements and to match members um, to your scheme database, um, and then start talking about what needs to be done, how it's going to be done, who's going to do it, that kind of thing. So data comes first, really. And then from that, you can move towards the automation. Okay, super. Thanks very much, Lorraine. Well, I think, um... Uh, we've got loads of questions coming in in the Q&A, so I think we're going to try and spend the last few minutes just getting through as many of those uh, as possible. And if we don't get through them, we will compile a list of sort of frequently answered questions that we'll put up on the website at some point in the next few days. But uh, in no particular order, I see there's one from Christine Jones, and it may be, uh, Richard, it's one for you. She's asking about staging dates. Are they currently available? And if so, where are they available? Richard. Almost like we rehearsed it, James. So a quick plug again for the scheme checklist, the PLSA pension scheme checklist um, on the pensions dashboards hub. I think the link was put on the, the chat earlier. So there it is again. Um, do have a look at that. On the back side, page two of that, we've summarised schedule two of the dashboards regulations, the draft uh, regulations. Uh, and there's a little example there of how to use it. You have to look at your active and deferred in your TPR return from 2021, and then look up in the table what type of scheme you are and what number was in, in that return. And that'll give you your date. 
Um, so that's really, really key. While we're talking, James, on the hub, my contact details are there. And I think I wanted to just do a little plug here because I think from some of the some of the comments in the chat, I think there are some core elements about understanding of what's being brought yeah. forward by government that that it that organizations like PLSA need to try and help explain. I think PLSA is here to help the members, the schemes. So I think the question I would have to all our members is how can we help you with that learning? So any ideas, please click on my name, send me ideas about what would help you to learn. Uh, and one final third thing on that, I think there was a question about testing, user testing. Um, so I'd like I'd like to, to, to come to the, the, the PLSA view on that in a second, but just to say a lot has happened already. So also on the checklist is a link to the Pensions Dashboard Program website. If you go to that, you'll see a lot has happened already. Last summer, there was uh, PDP user research and a big report was published in January. The Association of British Insurers also did some research published in January. There's a lot more testing going on, as Dave has said, in the program already. But moving forward, what the international evidence shows is you have to start testing with real data. Obviously, appropriately uh, protected and pseudonymized, but showing real people their real pensions. So the alpha phase right now is using synthetic data, but as we move into the summer and autumn, it'll be um, real data. And this is again, another plea or plug. If there are PLSA member schemes who've got appetite and bandwidth to start feeding into that, to say, well, yes, we've got a group of members who might like to contribute to this um, and, and you know, shape how dashboards might look, then I think we'd be really interested to hear from you and then we can act as a conduit to feed that into, into the programme. Thanks, James. Thanks, Richard. Uh, looking at some more questions, and I think there's quite a few uh, for Lorraine because the admin issues, uh, the administration issues are really important. Um, Stephen Crosby says, uh, if on launch we're inundated with requests for figures, what timescales are our administrators required to respond within? Uh, I suppose the SLA is 10 working days, or is it 12 or 15 or 20? Lorraine? Well, according to the draft regulations, it's 10 working days for DB and three for DC. Um, uh, and that's probably less than most um, administrators are required to do under their contracts with their trustee boards. Yeah. So um, this is something of an issue. And again, this is something we've raised in response to consultation as well. What we didn't want to happen was for people to circumvent normal um, target turnaround times by going through the dashboard to request things instead of coming to us. So there's, there's a bit of a mismatch there that, that needs to be resolved, I think, um, in the regulations. But, uh, but that's where we are at the moment. OK, thanks, Lorraine. And I think this might be one for you, but it may be one of our other contributors who want to give me a wave. Uh, Christine Scott asks, uh, will a provider only deliver data if it recognises both your NI number and one of your previous addresses? I can chip in there, yeah, Richard, uh, yeah. James, Richard again. So with another hat on, I'm a part time at PLSA. I'm also a member of the Pensions Admin Standards Association Working Group on Dashboards. We've put out some matching guidance and that's available on the PASA website published in December and there'll be more iterations of that to come this year. What that says is it's most likely from, from the, the early schemes that have thought about this in depth, it's most likely that schemes will want to match on three core data items, personal mm -hmm. data items, which are surname, date of birth and national insurance number. So the headline is you'll never do better matching than spending your money on ensuring you've got accurate surnames, dates of birth and NI numbers on all of your deferred members and all of your um, active members. So that's the, that's the thing. Address isn't, I'm not sure if address is really going to work. Uh, you may know that I was involved on the Pensions Dashboard Programme in 2020 and led the team doing the data standards. When we did the call for input on data there, the feedback was, no, we really haven't got up-to-date uh, uh, addresses. We haven't even really sure that we've got the, 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 the last but one address. You know, for deferreds who were with us in the 1980s, it's almost certain we're going to have a dress that's two or three addresses ago. So I'm not sure how good a dress is going to be for matching. But if it can be used, we'll, we'll learn that through the, through the testing. Surname, Dob and Nino. That's the best way to go. Yeah, thanks, uh, Richard. And um, we've got a question here about our own PLSA retirement living standards, which I'm pleased to see uh, to say a lot of schemes are now 
using, which is uh, which is great uh, as, a, as a tool for helping people engage with their pension saving. Uh, and the question is, is there a plan to mandate the inclusion of retirement living standards in dashboards? I don't think that's going to be mandatory, is it, Richard? Well, we'd like, we'd certainly encourage it. What, what's your comment on that? I think testing to date is showing that, OK, it's great to see what I've got. But what am I aiming for? I think the next question people ask when they see what they've got, potentially per month or per year, when they're, say, 67 at state pension, that number, they need to get some context for it. So I don't think there'll be a mandate for a target, but I think um, dashboard providers, whether they are the money helper one at MAPS or any of the other dashboard providers, might find that to best help their uh, members, customers, savers, whatever we want to call them, the best help people, having some sort of target alongside the number could be helpful. Yeah. And Dave, did you have a comment on this? Because uh, I, I saw on your demo, you had a reference to, you know, whether you'd end up with a moderate or comfortable lifestyle. What, what's your, your view on using the, uh, the retirement living standards? Yeah, look, we, we'd, like, we'd like to use it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's unlikely that they'll be mandated though um but yeah that's something you know will be i suppose it's you know there's going to be more consultations uh, and an opportunity to feedback so it, it is worth kind of uh you know, people who are concerned about that engaging with the pdp program and, and feeding that in okay super well look, i can see we've just got a couple of minutes uh, to, to 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 go and there's a little bit of wrap up um which means we haven't got through quite all the questions and there are also i think quite a few questions buried in the chat which we didn't get to as well. It was very busy uh, there. So one thing we will do, as I said, is uh, Richard and I will uh, will we'll, uh, dig all that material out. We'll compile a list of frequently answered questions. I think we'll just build that up, won't we, Richard, on the PLSA's Pensions Dashboard Hub on our website as we go, because it's very clear from uh, this morning's session that there are a lot of questions and there's a big information and education job to do. Is that right? I think that's absolutely right. And that's the ambition. As I said, PLSA is here to support member schemes. Also, we point this out in the checklist. The pensions regulator will be uh, publishing more information, obviously, as the entity which is uh, going to be responsible for ensuring compliance. So there'll be more information there. And of course, the pensions dashboards program. I think part of what PLSA is here to do is to boil that down into yeah. bite sized chunk, you know, manageable. I mean, I've been a pensions administrator. I've been a pensions manager. It's busy, isn't it? You know, you only tend to look at what's urgent. So part of what we're here for, I think, is to boil it down, which is why we've literally done a one page checklist to get people going. So I think looking to do more of that. But please, as I say, I'll repeat, feed in ideas for how you would like to learn more uh, as as we develop. Yeah, that would be very welcome. So uh, post webinar follow up is going to be the recording, the slides uh, and the uh, two page, uh, the one, one, one page, two sides checklist. You'll get that in the next uh, few days. Um, I just want to mention, uh, it's been great doing this online webinar this morning, but the PLSA is going back to uh, an in-person approach for our big set piece conferences this year, and they're all available to book and register for if you haven't done it already. So that's our uh, investment conference, which is going to be in Edinburgh on the 25th and 26th of May, our local authority, uh, conference uh, in the Cotswolds on the 13th and 15th of June and annual conference is in Liverpool 12th and 13th of October. Uh, I'm absolutely confident we'll have plenty sessions on dashboards uh, in those events and keeping Richard and maybe some of our other speakers uh, busy because we're going to be coming back to those issues. So apart from that it just reminds, remains for me to thank very much our speakers Anna, Lorraine, Dave, Richard you all did a great job Thanks very much for everyone for dialing in and sending us your questions. Uh, and uh, we'll come back to all this at some point in the future, I'm sure. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day.